Open up your Bibles with me today to the book of Kings. This summer, we have been working our way through the uh, Old Testament and great theological truths in the Old Testament. If you notice in your bulletin, there's a one-page back-to-back handout that will provide you a summary of the book of Kings and what its uh, theological center is. As we enter into the book of Kings, you want to remember that 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, and 1st and 2nd Chronicles in the Hebrew Bible were originally one great history of the nation of Israel. A history that focused not on facts and dates and things like that, but it focused upon the relationship of the nation and the king to the covenants. And so, as we enter into 1 Kings, you'll see, if you can read it all the way here, or you have it in your bulletin, that in 1 Kings, Israel divided against itself and Yahweh, degenerates, because of the idolatrous apostasy of the kings and the people. Even today, when you travel in the land of Israel, there is a, almost a motto that they say, we will not fall unless we divide. They understand that throughout their history, they have really only fallen when they have divided, divided amongst themselves. And that's a pretty tough thing when you have over 30 political parties in uh, the land of Israel today. But that's what happened in the book of Kings. The land divided. It divided, first of all, away from the covenant of God. Secondly, it divided after the Solomonic period. During the first 11 chapters, we see a united kingdom under prosperity and worship. And that's because there was a covenant celebration. During the life of Solomon, there was uh, uniting around the covenant law of God, even though we'll see in his older age, he began to stray from that and he sowed the seeds that led to a civil war to a divided nation. But when we get into the second part of Kings, we see it's a divided nation. The north from the south, ten tribes against two tribes. Divided kingdom, decline and apostasy because of covenant violation. In the first 11 chapters, they're united in worship. But the latter part of the book, they're divided in worship and divided by warfare. It is a sad story, but it is one that is very predictable. When sin grows in the camp, it destroys the land. The argument of the book of 1 Kings is that Israel's degeneration, its its decline in judgment, ultimately into exile. And what we have to do is we have to complete 1 Kings and 2 Kings to see the conclusion of why the ten northern tribes went into the captivity of Assyria. And then we look at 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles and we see even more completely how the two southern tribes went into captivity under the Babylonians. Israel's degeneration and judgment into exile because of its idolatrous kings and apostate people is delayed, is delayed by God's Gracious work in a few godly prophets and kings. Part of the message of kings is that there is always grace given from God. Even in the worst of times, the most difficult world or cultural crisis, God's grace is there for the godly. And we see Elijah, and we see Elisha, and we see Josiah, and we see Hezekiah, and we see these godly kings and godly prophets who because they stand for God in the midst 
of all kinds of difficulties and problems, and they pay the price for it. Amen? They pay the price for it. God uses them to bless the godly and to preserve the people. The purpose of the book is to show the exiled and chastised people. This book is not written for the people who are going through this. These books were completed and given to the community that went into exile. They're the ones who are really benefiting from this. And so it is written to show the exiled and the chastised people that the success or failure of the kingdom depends on the obedience of the king and the people to Yahweh's laws and covenants. That's what it's about. It's about telling the next generation, look, this is how your country, your people got into this situation. These are the consequences of bad decisions. These are the consequences of, of cultural decisions. Look at those consequences, and now you in your generation do something different. Obey God. Listen to his word. Now, 1 Kings opens up with a, what, I, what I think is kind of a sad statement. There's no commentary on it. In 1 Kings chapter 1, look at verses 5 and 6. 1 Kings chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Now, Adonijah, whose mother was Haggith, put himself forward and said, I will be king. Now, remember, David is growing old. David is about to die. And the two oldest brothers have died. Absalom and his brother that he murdered are dead. And so now Adonijah appears to be the oldest next to Solomon. And so he's ready to be king. I will be king. So he got chariots and horses ready with 50 men to run ahead of him. That's very kingly, you know. Today we'd uh, rent a big limousine, uh, hire a lot of police, have a lot of flags, have some music, and the person would get out and campaign. He's campaigning to be king. He's planning on being king. Now notice this statement in verse 6. It, it's in parentheses because it's almost a, a, a commentary statement by the author, which needs no explanation. His father had never interfered with him by asking, why do you behave as you do? Think about that. His father had never interfered with him by asking, son, why do you behave the way you do? Now, dad's, this is the toughest thing in life, I think, isn't it? Close to. It's the most frustrating thing in life. And I'm sure that mothers have to do it with daughters at times, too. And, and hopefully they tag up in a team occasionally and work on this. But Adonijah, David had never come to him and said, Son, what in the world are you doing? Why are you, why are you doing that? David was so busy with his kingdom and all of the other sons or wives or whatever that, and Bathsheba, as we saw last week, that he never confronted this son and said, what, what are you doing? The book of Proverbs is filled with admonitions to sons and to fathers. And those admonitions to the fathers and to the sons is, look, if you really love your son, you're going to have a relationship of discipline. You're going to have a relationship that will involve chastisement. You're going to have a relationship that's going to involve friction and tension. And those are hard times and hard years at times, aren't they? You know? When parents have to say to children, what in the world are you doing? You know? Where's the common sense here? Don't you understand? And of course, kids, and I'm going to make a lot of this today because it's one of my few opportunities because it's right from the scriptures. But what's the reaction of kids so very often? Oh, my parents don't know what they're talking about. It's, I'm the exception to the rule. 
It's going to happen to everybody else, but I'm the exception to the rule, so on and so forth. And for Adonijah, this was a devastating mistake that David had made with him by not confronting his son about issues. Now, I don't have all the answers, obviously. You're going to have to see me in 10 years, maybe 20 years. And I'll point you to somebody that may have the answers. But I do know this. A loving father, loving parents ask their children these questions. What in the world are you doing? Why are you doing that? Don't you understand the consequences? And a child that is maturing and a child that is seeking wisdom will sit down and shut their mouth and open up their ears to the wisdom that comes from loving experience. And that's what Adonijah should have done. Now, we have another son, Solomon, that we're going to look at. And David takes the time to say something to Solomon. And for Solomon, it's a blessing to him for the great majority of his life. But towards the end, he begins to forget what his dad said to him. You remember there are three stages in the life of a son. My dad can whoop your dad, first stage. Second stage, yeah, I can remember as a kid saying that and thinking to myself, oh, man, oh, man, I got my dad in some real trouble. Mr. Kelly's huge, you know. <laughs> but my dad can whoop your dad. Second statement, my dad doesn't know anything. Third statement, you know, my dad used to say, rules and laws are not for the mature. They're for the immature. Standards are not for the obedient and for the wise. They're for the disobedient and the foolish. And the commentary on the life of David's relationship to Adonijah was his father had never interfered with him by asking, why do you behave as you do? The book of Proverbs, Solomon tells us over and over again, loving fathers, loving mothers, loving parents interfere. They get in the way. They get in the face. They have times of friction and difficulty. Times of heartache. Hopefully, ultimately, we are not Adonijah's in the end, but at least we listen for a while like Solomon. Now turn if you, with me, if you will, to 1 Kings chapter 2 as we take a look at the advice that King David gives to Solomon. 1 Kings chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. When the time drew near for David to die, he gave a charge to Solomon, his son. Verse 2. I am about to go the way of all the earth, he said. First thing he wants Solomon to understand is, Solomon, I'm not only going to die, but everybody's going to die. And you know what? In this statement, I think he's also saying, Solomon, someday you're going to die. Death is a part of life. The understanding of death brings value to life. When you understand that the time you have been given is limited, uh, you know, there, there's no, like driving a car, gas stations to pull into and fill up, is there? Wouldn't that be wonderful to just be able to pull into a health clinic and say, fill me up with 10 more years of good health? Uh, got a little arthritis problem in the tires today. Can you give me a little arthritis air? There's no, there's no service stations here 
where you can come in and fill it up. You know, they can patch it. But Solomon, I, I, I'm going the way of all the earth. That's an important concept for people to understand. The Old Testament, we're told to count our days. Solomon, I'm going to die. You're going to die. I remember years ago when we were 1988, when we were the summer of 98, when we were 88, when we were living in Israel. And I uh, took Daniel uh, pretty much everywhere with me. I went on archaeological sites. And uh, we went over to the Ecole Biblique, the French School of Archaeology. And uh, we walked into one of the tombs. One of the senior uh, teachers there uh, gave us a tour. And uh, we walked in one of the tombs. And here in the tombs, underneath the, the uh, 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 bed chamber, were all the bones, the skulls, the bones of people who had died as much as uh, back as the first and second century A.D. And as we looked into there, I said to Dan, I said, you know, Dan, this is kind of a creepy place. Um, but I want you to understand something, Dan. We're all going to die. And you've got to live life in light of eternity. In light of the fact that this is where we're all headed. This life, God has given to us to get ready for the next life. And so you invest yourself. David says to Solomon, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. So he said, so be strong, be courageous. Uh, this is something that is echoed to Moses, echoed to Joshua, echoed to Caleb, echoed to the people, and now echoed to Solomon also. Son, you're going to need to be strong. Because the truth of the matter is, if you are weak, you are going to be eaten, won't you? Uh, this is a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there, isn't it? Corporate America, business America, government, so on and so forth. If you're going to stand and live in this world, you're going to need to get strong over the years. Strong not so much with muscles, but with fortitude. And uh, Solomon was going into a very difficult situation. He was going to have to go in and consolidate the kingdom because he had a brother who wanted it. He had a high priest who had thrown in with his brother. He had a military leader who had thrown in with his brother. He had had uh, tribal groups who had thrown in with his brother. And he was going to have to come in and consolidate the power of his kingdom. And in order to accomplish that, he was going to need to be strong. So be strong, he says, and show yourself a man. What a cool way of saying it. Every father says this to his son, doesn't he? All too often. Son, it's time to grow up. It's time to be responsible. It's time to be accountable. And of course, this also fits for all of our ladies also. Mothers saying to their daughters, it's time to grow up. It's time to be responsible. It's time to be accountable. David says to Solomon, look, you need to show yourself a man. Be a man, Solomon. Be accountable. Be responsible. And we can see this throughout the book of Proverbs as he writes about father-son relationships and about what it is to be a man. Now, to be a man, according to the Bible and according to David, is this. Show yourself a man and observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in all his ways, keep his decrees and commands, his laws and requirements as written in the law of Moses. What does it mean to be strong, to be a man? It means that you're going to obey the Lord your God. To be a man of God, to be a woman of God, is to obey God's word, and that is takes strength that takes courage that takes commitment doesn't it 
because you are going against the flow. You're like a salmon swimming upstream the whole way because the cultural current is going the other way towards ungodliness, unrighteousness, a lack of integrity, a lack of moral standards. Corporate America is filled with it. Government is filled with it. And, you know, Solomon was going to come in and have to set up all of that. Government, military, all business, tremendous businessman. He had all of that that he was going to have to set up. And if he was going to set it up in such a way for it to last, it was going to have to be according to God's word. And so he needed to obey God's word. That's what it is to be a man. That's what it is to be a woman. See, it's not manly to give in to the ways of the world, to go along with your friends, to, to buy into, well, everybody else is doing it, to buy into, well, if it feels good, do it. That, that's, not, that's not manly. Manliness is when you stand for what is right because it is right. Not because you're afraid of getting caught, not because of consequences that may come upon you, it's because you do what is right because it is right. And in order to do that, you've got to know God's word. And so one of the things that was required, particularly of the kings, and something that David did, was to meditate on the word of God day and night and to apply the word of God to life. And that is what a man does. So be strong, show yourself a man, and observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in all of his ways, not some of his ways. You walk in all of his ways. This isn't uh, baseball where if you're batting 350, you're a major leaguer and you're doing great. <laughs> you know, you got to try to bat a thousand. Keep his laws and requirements as written in the law of Moses. Now, what are the results of it? Notice what the results are. First of all, so that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you go. What are the blessings that come from being a man of God and obeying God's word? Now, we've got to be careful here because this is not health, wealth, and prosperity preaching. This is not an absolute guarantee. This isn't something where you say, all right, God, you know, Blessings on projects, blessings on business, blessings on trips, blessings on all of these things. You know, it's just too good to turn down. I'm going to buy into it. <laughs> You're not going to have the right heart attitude for that. You obey God because it's the right thing to do. But obedience to God's word brings natural blessings. And one is, it says that God will prosper you in your projects so that he may prosper you in all that you do success yes that's what we want in life what is god's success for our life we're not talking about riches and and prestige and all of those things necessarily we're talking about a wholeness of life a, a, a blessing of life having all that we need, not necessarily all that we want. <laughs> if we got everything we wanted, if I got everything I wanted, man, would I be in trouble? Gosh, I'm so thankful that God says no and slaps my hand and kicks my, uh, or uh, hits my head. <laughs> you know? Prosperity in Projects. Secondly, he says, you will be blessed, you will prosper in all that you do and wherever you go. In the travels and the journeys of life, as you go about here and there, as you move from here to there, as you move about the employment opportunities or, or neighborhoods or whatever, God is going to bless you and watch over you. Another thing he says, and that the Lord may keep his promise to me. Now, God made a promise to David. You remember 2 Samuel chapter 7. 
He said to David, look, David, I'm going to make a dynasty out of you. I'm making a covenant with you. And forever, for eternity, someone from your seed will sit upon the throne over the nation of Israel and will reign as king of kings. Now, in order for that to happen, your seed, your descendants, those who follow you, are going to have to obey my word and keep the covenant. And if they don't obey my word and keep my covenant, then they're not going to benefit from it. But I will guarantee you that in spite of the failure of man, I will sovereignly make sure that someone from your seed reigns over Israel and over this world for eternity. And we know in the opening words of Matthew and Luke, and as Paul speaks of Jesus, he is of the seed of David. He is of the tribe of Jesse, the tribe of Judah. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. And David says to Solomon, now look, if you obey God's word, then God will be able to fulfill his promise to me concerning my descendants. Yes, when we obey God's word, he fulfills his promises of blessings to us. Now, there's the other side of that coin, and that is when we disobey his word, he fulfills his promises to us also. <laughs> the promises of chastisement and loving judgment. Yes, he will fulfill his promises to me. Now, notice in verse 4, if your descendants watch how they live, and if they walk faithfully before me with all their heart and soul, you will never fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. David is telling Solomon, look, there are generational blessings if they will faithfully follow the Lord God. Now, this is a message for the next generation to hear. All right? Whoever's the next generation, you need to hear this message. <laughs> you can only live off the blessings and the umbrella protection of your parents for so long. And then you're on your own. And you're before God, and it's you and God, and what you do is what's going to happen. If you obey God, he's going to bless you. If you disobey him, he's going to chastise you. Remember we said uh, in the previous weeks, if you're not right with God, it seems that everything goes wrong. And there's always this collateral damage when you're around people who aren't right with God because things are always going wrong. And they're always getting into trouble. They're always having difficulties. And, of course, that collateral damage ends up rippling out into other worlds. The next generation, there comes a time when you've got to grow up, when you've got to take responsibility, and you've got to say, hey, I have to be faithful. I have to be obedient. I have to be the one trusting and walking with God. Because it's up to you. And if you don't do it, nobody can do it for you. David is trying to tell Solomon something about moving along generationally. What a, what a wonderful, wonderful advice that he gives to Solomon. And this is advice that Solomon follows for a period of time. You know in 1 Kings chapter 3, when Solomon is uh, said to, uh, God says, tell me whatever you want. Uh, you know, it's, it's like the old story of the genie. I'll grant you one big wish. I think I shared with you the human side of this story where a, um, a uh, Rhodes Scholar professor uh, who was doing uh, uh, some archaeological research discovered an Aladdin's lamp. And so he brought it into the university and he rubbed it. And out came the genie. And the genie says, you can, you can have one wish. And the guy thought for a while and he says, I want the wisdom and the intellect of the ages. Poof. He became the most brilliant professor in the world. His students stopped and asked him immediately, Oh, wise professor, what is the wisdom of the ages? And he said, Take the money next time. <laughs> See, that's the world's 
take on this, that money and things are the most important thing in life. But not for Solomon. Not for the Word of God. Solomon says, I need wisdom. I need discernment. Ah, you've given me this great people, this great opportunity, this, this great kingdom. And I need wisdom and discernment to be able to rule and guide these people. And God blessed him. And because he had that wisdom, because he had that insight and that maturity of life, God did bless him because he was obedient for a long period of time. I mean, Solomon controlled the world economically. He controlled the world politically. He controlled the world militarily. You know, he, he set up breadbasket cities throughout the Middle East. He set up shipping ports so that he controlled the movement of commerce. He set up military posts so that he controlled all of the main thoroughfares and highways. He, he had it all. But if you'll turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 11, we see that he trades it in for some of the temporal things of this world. First Kings chapter 11. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women. Besides Pharaoh's daughters, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonites, Hittites, they were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Now, is there anything here that's hard to understand or, or, or that needs explanation? When God's word says to the Israelites, you do not marry non-covenant believers. Because if you marry a non-covenant believer, you're not going to win them over. They're going to win you over. They're going to win you over because you've already disobeyed me and put a big chasm of sin between you and I and our relationship. You don't, you don't marry non-covenant believers. How much clearer could he be to Solomon? And yet Solomon did it hundreds and thousands of times over and over again and sinned against the covenant of God and against God himself. Here again, it's just such a, an important practical point for those young people who are here. God's word is very clear, Old Testament, New Testament. You can marry whoever you want to, but it better be a believer in Jesus Christ. And if you're really wise, you'll get a believer in Jesus Christ who's growing in Jesus Christ. Because the word of God is very clear on this. There is no compromise. There is no missionary dating evangelism. Your heart will be turned away from the Lord. Don't come to me ever, please, and say to me, Pastor John, would you marry us if you're not both believers? I would be disobeying God's word to even think of participating in such a thing. King Solomon loved many foreign women. He says, you must not intermarry with them. But nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth. Now, you need to understand, these marriages are both political and sexual. And 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. Over a 1,000. Now, what does that tell us? There's something here that that tells us. What that tells us is sexual fulfillment, marital fulfillment, moral fulfillment does not come in the amount, but in the quality. If it came in the amount, why didn't he stop at 100, 
200, 300, 400. Why do you have to go to 1,000 and beyond if there was real satisfaction and fulfillment? Fulfillment of desires comes in God's will. Not in the Sam Malones of this world as perpetuated to us through the media or other things. It's not in the quantity, it's in the quality. Verse 4, as Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. He followed Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonites, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as David his father had done. And then it gives us a little bit of geography and topography, which we may be able to look at next week when we look at 2 Kings. You know, Solomon, outside of Jerusalem, built all of these houses and places of worship round about the mountains of Jerusalem for his wives and for their gods. But he never brought them into Jerusalem because he knew that Jerusalem was the place of Yahweh. And so he lived in such hypocrisy and a dichotomy of faith. What were the things that we see here that Solomon went after that took him down? Power through the politics and the intermarriages, immorality, and idolatry. He replaced God with things. It was a long time ago, but human nature hasn't changed, has it? Power Morality, immorality, and idolatry are still the great sins that conquer our soul. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we pause now to pray, we are reminded from your word how important it is that we obey you that we obey your word. Father, thank you for loving us through Jesus Christ, for sending Jesus Christ to die for our sins. Thank you, Father, for choosing and desiring to bless us. And Father, I pray that you would help us all to be strong as men and women of God. Father, I pray that you'd work in the hearts of each and every one here today, including myself. Strengthen us in the inner person that we might obey your word, that we might walk in your statutes, that we would live in light of eternity, knowing that time is ticking. Father, help us to live in such a way that there will be generational blessings that those who come behind us will find us faithful. 